Rachel Oates on the 1st of October, 2020. These kinds of people who think it's worse to be called transphobic than it is to do anything transphobic, or that it's worse to be called a misogynist than it is to say misogynistic things. Like, it's ridiculous, it's not. Just, just be a good person and you won't be called these things. Rachel Oates on the 5th of April, 2022. Quote, so quick art day. I filed a defamation claim against EOT's video and YouTube agreed with me that it is in violation of the UK's defamation laws and so have restricted it from being played in the UK. The big claims in their video that I'm a serial transphobe are utterly false and are said with the intent of damaging my reputation. End quote. It's ridiculous, it's not. Just, just be a good person and you won't be called these things. This is just one piece of evidence out of many that Rachel Oates wants to ban you from seeing. Why? Well, because it draws into question her own actions, a fact we'll discuss in further detail in a second. But first, a quick content warning for the following. Transmisia, queermisia, HIV, genocide, harassment, suicidal ideation, and doxing. If you like our work and appreciate the research put into each video, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon. You can also support us by liking, commenting, and sharing this video on social media. Hi there, my name is Ethel Thurston, she, her, they, them, and today we'll be continuing our journey to document the impact Rachel Oates has had on the trans community, specifically how she published private information taken from a trans-focused mental health support group, a group set up specifically to help those fleeing the harassment directed at them by her friend Stephen Woodford of Rationality Rules. This video is the second in a five-part series, with each video documenting a key incident between Rachel Oates and the trans community. The first video was an update on the case at the start, going over how Oates is using the UK's draconic defamation laws to silence her trans critics. We also looked at how Oates trivialised JK Rowling's transmisia, attempting to defend the purchase of Harry Potter merchandise in spite of a portion of the royalties made from said IP being funneled directly into anti-trans campaigning in the UK. So do watch that video when you can. All of our work is fully referenced so that you can check things for yourself. And just remember, if you're in the UK and find yourself unable to watch any of the videos in this series, due to Osa's habit of weaponizing the UK's draconic defamation laws to stifle free speech, specifically criticism, you can use a VPN to get around the issue, or simply read the transcript linked in the description of each video. For the VPN, just change your country of origin to be outside of the UK, and you'll be able to access the wealth of evidence presented, allowing you to make up your own mind, something Rachel Oates would deny you. Moving on to today's topic, to understand the impact of Rachel Oates publishing private information taken from a trans-focused mental health support group, first, we need some background. Note that this is just a quick summary of key events, and that if you want extra details, you should check out my playlist of the relevant videos. If you like a first-hand telling of the events surrounding the ACA, be sure to listen to Kevin Logan's interviews with ACA veterans Tracy, Jen, Claire, John, and Chelsea. So on the 30th of March 2019, YouTube creator Stephen Woodford of Rationality Rules published a video titled the athletic advantage of transgender women and why it is unfair. A video in which he'd argue for stripping trans women of various human rights, attempting to justify doing so via alarmist claims about how trans women would kill women's sports. This of course upset a lot of trans people who began reaching out to me by the dozens, pleading with me to make a response. So that's exactly what I did. Publishing a video pulling apart Woodford's so-called science on the 6th of April. Now I could continue on this for hours, but for the sake of brevity, I'll keep things short by emphasising just one of the advantages that men have over women. When asked why men outperform women in most athletic events, Jamie Pringle, a physiologist who's trained many Olympic champions, said the following. The most consistent observation about the difference is that women have lower total mass of hemoglobin in their blood compared to men, and less blood in total. This means less capacity to transport oxygen in the blood, which, when combined with the heart's ability to pump that blood, and the muscle's capacity to extract the oxygen from it, is a key determinant of aerobic fitness and endurance. 
And so, the assertion that reducing a transgender woman's testosterone to that of the average biological woman will create a level playing field is objectively, scientifically, bogus. If Joe was to reduce his testosterone, he would still have his enormous hands, just as Rachel still has a small pelvis and Laurel still has a large number of fast twitch muscle fibres. Did you get that, you unrehearsed emotional college students? Hemoglobin is the number one advantage cis men have over cis women, and as we all know, blood doesn't change. You're born with the very blood you'll die with. So there's absolutely no chance that said hemoglobin count could lessen with HRT. Trans women have an unfair advantage, and that's the science. Well, this is awkward. You see, this is what happens when you attempt a bait and switch, using studies comparing cis women to cis men, rather than cis women to trans women on HRT. You end up talking a load of pure bollocks about hemoglobin being the greatest source of trans women advantage, only to then discover that hemoglobin counts of trans women are the same as those of cis women. I also called him out on his alarmist rhetoric, and I'm convinced that unless quickly rectified, this will kill women's sport. I don't want to see the day when women's athletics is dominated by Y chromosomes, but without a change in policy, that is precisely what's going to happen. Oh dearie me, the ultralight man is here to teach us about his fears for women's sports. So what says he? What beckons the end of athletic womanhood? Of course, Stephen Woodford from Rationality Rules is jumping on the anti-trans bandwagon. Because when the Bible thumpers are too busy to blame us for every natural disaster on this planet, the trademark skeptics step up to claim that we're destroying Western civilization, piece by piece. And I get that some people may feel that I'm being a teensy bit unfair here, but how else am I supposed to respond to such alarmist rhetoric? All whilst making it explicitly clear that there was a way for him to fix things should he actually want to. So I expect you to have the decency to do the right thing. Prove me wrong on the alt light remark. Prove to me that you are better than that. Because from watching the rest of your video, I really question that. A lot of what is said is not just factually wrong, it's unnecessarily hostile and dehumanising towards trans people. Woodford responded by refusing to watch past the first six minutes of my response, after he just spent days bitching about people not watching more than seven minutes of his video. Not a great sign. Though eventually he calmed down and told me that he fixed the video, Yet it stayed up, public and unedited, misleading who knows how many tens of thousands of people. However, I said nothing at the time. As a trans person who came out during the Gamergate era, I knew what happens to marginalised creators who rock the proverbial boat. So instead of pushing him, I decided to give Woodford all the space he could ask for to get his shit together. A move that was widely praised at the time. That said, I began to worry that people would try and start shit at the upcoming Faithless Forum, a secular conference in the US that Woodford would be attending, but I wouldn't. So I cobbled together a four minute video explaining that Woodford promises to fix things so don't bother him at the conference. At the same time, I requested that anyone attending please correct the narrative if they hear someone trying to spin me as being some hyper-aggressive trans person tearing apart the community. I simply requested that they point out the facts that Woodford came into my backyard and used bad science to argue in favour of stripping trans people of our human rights, not the other way around. And you'll never guess what happened. Another secular YouTuber by the name of Telltale Atheist, one of the event's organisers, began telling people that I'd instigated violence at the Faithless Forum on par with the burning down of religious homes. He also declared that video had been captured as said violence and would soon be published for all to see. Of course, said evidence didn't exist. I wasn't even at the conference, leading Telltale to backtrack from what was clearly an example of unprovoked trans misogyny. I said absolutely nothing to him, yet he was already trying to paint me as an inherently aggressive trans person, a monster that everyone could rally around to destroy. Telltale would later take another crack at this after the events of September, claiming that I'd apparently run a Christian woman off of YouTube and was thus a danger to all cis women. What he conveniently left out was the fact that she left not because of me, but because she destroyed her own soft image, becoming the laughingstock of the entire LGBT class community on YouTube. 
Aya Manuela was a Christian YouTuber who had grown her channel by doing this very cutesy flashcard video, attracting a lot of people, both Christian and non, only to then come out and compare gay people to child molesters and school shooters, label HIV as God's punishment for homosexuality, and cite Bible passages ordering for the murder of gay people. Suffice to say, a number of secular and LGT plus folk responded, criticising her calls for gay genocide. And Telltale knew this, with me having pointed this out to him and his friends back in May, yet he still chose to pretend like criticising her for doing so was abuse and harassment. So just a real swell guy. Now, unbeknownst to me at the time, on the 20th of April, Woodford would make a guest appearance on The Atheist Experience, a popular show run by the Atheist Community of Austin, or ACA, which he visited with others from the UK, including Rachel Oates. The ACA is a community of secularists drawn together by their struggles and was considered, at the time, to be supportive of the LGT plus community, including trans people. The ACA was subsequently inundated with messages from trans people, complaining about said appearance in light of Woodford's recent and still uncorrected video. This led the ACA to hold a board meeting, which found that, yeah, they'd fucked up. That not only did they let someone known for promoting anti-trans pseudoscience onto their previously LGBT plus supportive show, but that the people involved had been aware, with Matt Dillahunty personally pushing for Woodford's inclusion in spite of the video. The board drafted an apology to the LGT plus community, stating that they should have taken one of two courses of action. That they should have a. addressed the issue right out the gate to give Woodford a chance to fix things then and there, or b. have waited for him to first issue his correction. This apology was then passed by a vote and was subsequently published to the ACA's social media on the 9th of May. That's when I first heard about Woodford's appearance on the show. One of the accusations hurled at me regarding this whole series of events is that I had declared myself the trans community whilst only acting in my self-interest. This is why I feel it's important to stress that not only did I create my original response at the behest of other trans people, but there was a spontaneous outcry in response to Woodford's appearance on the atheist experience. Sadly, the backlash to the apology was instantaneous. Woodford cried foul about the apparent unfairness of the statement, with his followers, mostly cis men, flooding the ACA social media and even going so far as to target individual moderators, attacking them for the ratified statement. They not only hurled transmissive abuse at them, but also ableist, misogynist, and racist abuse. At the same time, those at the ACA who supported Woodford, like Matt Dillahunty and then board president Jamie Boone, were doing everything they could to reverse the decision of the board, blocking up the system. This meant that when the moderators pleaded for aid in dealing with the torrent of abuse, no aid came. Woodford then published his video on the 11th of May, comparing herself to, and you're not going to believe this, Galileo being judged by the Roman Inquisition. You know, the guy who was famously right about the Earth revolving around the Sun? This is when I began to realise that Woodford had no real intention of fixing anything, and that he was actually getting ready to take another swing at the trans community. So I responded, commenting on how Woodford claimed he hadn't had time to fix his original mistake or even update the video's title, yet he somehow managed to publish an entire video in less than two days, labelling criticism regarding that very mistake as slanderous. Not that it helped much. Woodford's video only fueled the abuse, directing hundreds of thousands of people from YouTube to the ACA moderators for their imagined crimes. Things got so bad that the moderators, many of whom have dealt with the absolute horrors of Christianity and numerous cults, walked out. At which point a number of them created a Facebook group so that they could all stay in touch to support one another, a group that would steadily grow as things got worse and worse at the ACA. Jamie Boone called in Shannon Q, a cis woman, 
to help him write a clarification which kicked the LGBT plus community, particularly the trans community, to the ground in favour of Woodford, a statement he went on to publish on the 17th of May, claiming that the board had officially retracted its initial statement, in spite of the fact that they'd done no such thing. Said lie resulted in a second set of walkouts, this time taking several of the ACA board members. Things only continued to escalate as the ACA board elections took place on the 18th, the day after Boone had undercut the previous board. Thomas Westbrook, aka Holy Kool-Aid, turned up with a massive gang of Woodford supporters, who all signed up for ACA membership with the intention of voting. Westbrook's group was seen passing around a pre-selected list of board members to vote in, board members who were supportive of Woodford. Yet they didn't merely vote, they turned the entire thing into a McCarthy-style farce, with Westbrook interrogating members not on his list, effectively asking them, do you support the original statement or have you ever supported it, before dragging them over the coals if they said anything but no. The environment was so hostile that one person even reported feeling physically intimidated by Westbrook and his thugs into abstaining from voting altogether. That's when the third and final set of walkouts took place, leaving the ACA a dishevelled husk of its former self. That is the backdrop for today's topic, something I feel is necessary to understand its true impact. This wasn't some minor hiccup. Some of these people, such as Tracy Harris and Jen Peoples, had been volunteering at the ACA for decades. This wasn't a loose network of people, it was a community in the strictest definition of the term. Many of the people who ended up leaving joined the group mentioned earlier, and a number of them, particularly the moderators who were on the front lines, went on to develop mental health problems ranging from insomnia to suicidal ideation as a result of the abuse they were made to suffer. This wasn't some party. This was a private mental health support group established to help those who had just witnessed Transmisia tear their community apart. So you can probably imagine the horror when, on the 14th of May, Rachel Oates published a screenshot taken from that group alongside the following rant. Quote, Just been shown a screenshot and I've gotta say, if you're gonna start making lists, you better put me on both. I support Steve because I don't want to see the community divided. I won't denounce a friend for one mistake. I know he's working hard to learn about what he did wrong, and I know how hard he's working to put things right. Supporting Steve now does not mean I agree with everything he said in his video. We're allowed to have differing opinions. That said, if I genuinely thought he was transphobic, I wouldn't be supporting him, but I know he never intended to cause harm, and definitely didn't expect certain people to use his video to try and push harmful agendas. I, like so many other creators on that list, have consistently shown our support for the trans community. So it's not a choice between supporting Steve or supporting transgender people. We can, and do, support both. Can we all just stop trying to create an us versus them thing? Can we stop trying to pit atheists and YouTubers against each other? Can we realise that we can disagree with someone's ideas and thoughts, and we can work to correct them and help them learn, without it having to turn into an all-out war against a person? People making lists like this need to grow up. You can disagree with ideas without hating a person. You can like a person and not agree on everything. I support transgender people. I support other YouTubers. I support people taking time to learn and grow. I don't support drama and pitting people against each other and acting like children. This whole, oh, your friends with X, so I don't like you anymore, is so immature. End quote. Which Shannon Q, the cis woman who had helped the ACA kick the LGBT plus community to the curb, responded to with a gift saying, yes, queen. 
Because why wouldn't they engage in the appropriation of Black American English whilst defending their anti-trans bigotry? Quick side note, that black bar was added by me and is not in the original image, a fact we'll be returning to in a bit. But let's start by calling out the big issue with the evidence Oates is presenting, which is that this was a private list in a small group. This had happened before the second and third walkouts took place, so there were only around 20 people in the group, a fact which Mrs. Snarky was quick to point out. This wasn't a blacklist intended to cut people out of the secular community, they didn't have that power. It was a list intended to keep people safe. Two lists were drawn. The first of people who had spoken out about Woodford and were thus known to be safe, at least regarding this issue, and a second list of people who had a history of working with Woodford and had yet to say anything in support of the trans community on the matter. And the reason for this was perfectly highlighted in the response by Mo the Sheep, who stated that, quote, I'm not sure the people who aren't LGBT plus can empathize with the sheer level of paranoia some of us experience in trying to get into new YouTubers. It feels like a Russian roulette wheel, end quote. Many of the trans people who came to me initially, pleading with me to respond to Woodford, had been former fans. Hell, a couple of them had even given to his card game Kickstarter. Then, on top of that, people like Telltale Atheist, Matt Dillahunty, and Shannon Q had shown us what they really are. A lot of the figures once considered safe to trans people had proven themselves otherwise. So yes, lists were drawn inside a private mental health support group to try and keep its members safe by documenting who had and who hadn't come out in support of the trans community, so that innocent trans people weren't caught in the crossfire. If this sounds at all familiar, that's likely because there's been a lot of discussion the past few years about women creating similar lists to keep themselves safe, particularly in relation to the Me Too movement. Women from all backgrounds, though perhaps most notably those at university or doing sex work, create private lists of classmates or clients known to be safe or dangerous as a means of protecting one another due to how hard it is to get the system to take sexual violence seriously, much less act on it. Just like transmisia. Point is, such lists have a feminist history as a way for a community to keep its members safe. And if you don't want to end up on them, stop being such a horrific ghoul. You have no right, no right whatsoever, to demand that people force themselves to interact with you and your bigoted friends. Oates did respond to Mrs. Snarky, stating that she did not know the source of the screenshot was a small group. Which, let's stop to think about. Rachel Oates, self-declared skeptic, got sent a screenshot from an undisclosed source which could have literally been written by anyone, including those supporting Woodford's descent into open transmisia, and she did not hesitate to publish it, demonizing trans people and those harassed for defending trans people as divisive. Doesn't that strike anyone as just a little opportunistic? Like, she claims she doesn't want division, but here she is, publishing unverified posts which create exactly that. She is setting up an us versus them mentality when she does this. And just to be clear, whilst that still would have been the case even if she had verified the screenshot, the fact that she didn't makes it all the worse. But what's even more interesting is how she kept the post up, mischaracterizing it after she'd been informed of the list's actual nature. She didn't take it down or issue a clarification, she instead continued to dishonestly portray this as a blacklist rather than a safety tool created by and for trans people. I have this thing called the foot standard and it goes like this. Imagine we're in a crowded dance floor and someone accidentally steps on your foot, leading you to cry out. Now, a normal person would remove their foot and apologize, right? We'd expect them to stop doing things that hurt you and at least try to make amends. And that's fine. Accidents happen. Just try to be a little more careful and all's good. Right? Now, imagine if, instead of doing the right thing, said person goes, 
oh get used to it, and actually presses down on your foot as hard as they can. At that point, the fact that the original incident was an accident becomes immaterial. Doubling down makes their actions morally indistinguishable from someone who had initially targeted your foot. And I think that's a pretty simple standard that a lot of people can understand. So take that and apply it here. Rachel Oates had not only failed to do her due diligence in verifying the source of the original screenshot, but she then elected to keep her post up, a post which completely mischaracterized the actions of trans people trying to protect themselves, as said trans people being needlessly divisive. What does that tell you about Rachel Oates as a person? What does that say about her support for the trans community? Yet it gets even worse, because there was a person out there trying to get members of the secular community blacklisted. That person was Telltale Atheist. The whole Faithless Form incident started because someone had the audacity, the ghoul, to list me alongside him as one of their favorite secular YouTubers, telling someone asking for suggestions to quote, check out their Twitter and then check out their YouTube channels, they're great. Listening to them really helped me, end quote. That was what Telltale Atheist responded to a quote, Indeed, join our community. Although Essence of Thought tried to start shit at our conference, so I'm not super happy about that. Wouldn't recommend them. Either way, lots of us around. End quote. This then led him to compare said shit to the burning down of religious halls. Now, Telltale Atheist is not a small YouTuber. He was very active in the secular community and was an official organizer for the Faithless Forum. So this wasn't akin to a group of 20 people putting together a list to keep themselves safe. This was a highly public, highly targeted effort to shame someone for the crime of suggesting my work. This was an actual attempt at getting me blacklisted from people's personal list, an attempt made as I was still waiting to see if Woodford would fix his shit. So, how did Rachel Oates and the rest of the people circling the wagon around Woodford react? Did they admonish Telltale for being needlessly divisive? Did the Faithless Forum issue an official clarification slash apology for what one of their organizers had said in relation to their event? No, of course not. Because they don't actually have an issue with blacklisting, when it's done to a trans person defending their human rights. Woodford supporters only have an issue when they're being judged for their support of the very person calling for the removal of said human rights. I think there's a word for when we treat a person differently because of a group they belong to, particularly when that group is a marginalized community. Starts with a D, rhymes with incrimination. Sadly, I'm not sure if I'm able to say it without Rachel Oates trying to flag me doing so for defamation, so I'll let you fill in the blank yourself. With that massive flaw underscored, let's discuss how Rachel Oates does not stop once to check her privilege during her rant. Not once does she stop and remind herself that she is a cis person. Not once does she stop and consider that, hey, it isn't her place to dictate who is and isn't a trans ally, or how trans people should protect themselves from trans music violence. Like, she doesn't have to worry about anti-trans violence. Good for her! She doesn't have to live with the consequences of her friend's actions. We do. What's more is, Rachel Oates has shown us that she can excuse herself from discussion when she wants. When Gollus Cranium put out a call for prominent secular YouTubers to reaffirm the human rights of trans people on the 16th of May, Rachel Oates excused herself by asserting that she didn't feel knowledgeable enough to do so. To be clear, I opened my original response to Woodford by detailing the specific human rights violated by excluding a group of women from sports, using a list published by the United Nations regarding the exclusion of intersex women as my basis due to the similarities between the two groups in how they are treated. Those rights were the right to equality and non-discrimination, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the right to sexual and reproductive health, the right to work and to the enjoyment of just and favorable conditions of work, 
the right to privacy, the right to freedom from torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment and harmful practices, and full respect for the dignity, bodily integrity, and bodily autonomy of the person. So everyone involved in this, at least if they were listening to trans people like an ally would, knew that this was a human rights matter weeks before this post. They knew that Woodford was openly attempting to strip trans women of six distinct human rights. I bring this up because you don't need to have a full understanding of sports to support the human rights of trans people. If you haven't been shown extreme justification for their removal, such as a person being an immediate threat to someone else, you don't strip away their human rights. Period. And even when we are shown such justification, we usually only do so temporarily. That's why I take extreme issue with this idea that you can withhold support for said human rights on the possibility that there might be justification to strip them away, whilst also stating that you're supportive of the trans community. So when Paul, Shannon Q's husband, tried to pull that shit, I rightfully pointed out that doing so was akin to saying, I support gay people, but until I've been shown evidence that gay teachers aren't child predators, I refuse to defend gay people from accusations that they are. This is not a good faith argument. It's just an excuse to do nothing whilst declaring herself a trans ally. It also raises two questions. If she doesn't know enough to support the human rights of trans people on the topic, then how the fuck can she then claim to know that Woodford isn't transmisic regarding said topic? How the fuck can she dictate down to trans people about how we should protect ourselves? It's amazing how she acts like an expert when it comes to defending her friend's bigotry, yet the moment it comes to actually standing with the trans community, suddenly she doesn't have a clue. This is why I view her to be two-faced in her approach to trans rights. She should have either sided with trans people in standing up to demands to strip them of fundamental human rights in the absence of evidence, or have just removed herself from the discussion entirely. But she didn't. Instead, she chose to demonize trans people and victims of transmisic harassment for trying to keep themselves safe. Returning to what I said in my previous video on how Rachel Oates feels the need to stamp out any question that she's a good person when it comes to trans issues, this right here is one of the reasons I see that in her. She genuinely seems to believe that her word alone is enough to give her the mantle of trans ally, and that she has zero responsibility to actually listen to trans people. What she did here is no different to the dude asserting that he's a nice guy to the woman who just rejected him. It's all for show, and nothing else. So, with Rachel Osa's arguments left in ruin, we can finally move on to the crux of the matter, at least morally. And that is the fact that Rachel Oates published private information taken from a trans-focused mental health support group. Returning to that black bar I mentioned earlier, it covers someone's real name someone who fled the ACA after Oates' friend directed a torrent of abuse at them. That means Rachel Oates published the real name of someone desperately trying to escape harassment. And I get that this was an accident, initially, but can we at least comprehend the severity of what she did? This wasn't a faux pas. You cannot be this careless regarding victims of abuse and harassment, yet that isn't even the worst part. Oh no. Whilst pointing out that the list had been taken from a small private group, Mrs. Snarky also pointed out that, by publishing said private list, Rachel Oates was opening the users on that list to potential abuse. How, whilst claiming she didn't want division, she was creating just that. And yet, whilst Mrs. Snarky's comments strictly brought up the username on the list, Rachel Oates responded, noting that she failed to block out someone's real name, stating that, quote, I had no idea it was a small group until just now. I tried to censor all the names, it's just that after being awake for nearly 24 hours, I happened to miss one. That said, if you're going to post on Facebook, don't expect it to definitely stay private. End quote. So to be clear, I am not the one saying Rachel Oates published private information, Rachel Oates is the one who first pointed this out. I am merely repeating on said admission in its full context. 
that Rachel Oates felt the need to bring up the facts that she failed to blur someone's real name not only shows that she was aware of the issue, but that she had a guilty conscience. That she misunderstood Mrs. Snarky because she'd already noticed that she fucked up and was expecting to be called out on it. So, did Oates delete the post and issue an immediate apology to the victim she doxed? Did she take personal responsibility for her actions? Did she show a basic degree of human decency towards this person that was desperately trying to escape the tidal wave of hate set upon them by her friend? Of course not. Instead, she responded by claiming she was tired and blaming her victim. Because yes, that last line is straight up victim blaming. There is no difference between saying this and saying something like, well, if you're gonna go out at night, don't expect to be safe. Like, yeah, by entering a certain space at a certain time, people can act upon you, but that doesn't absolve the person actually doing the thing from their responsibility. Rachel Oates claims to be a feminist, but is engaging in very brazen victim blaming regarding someone she had just doxxed, someone who her friend's supporters were trying to harass and abuse. That is just sick. Rachel Oates chose to keep her post up, where it stayed, until she finally deleted her Twitter account sometime after October of 2020. She chose to keep someone's real name visible in a thread she had complete control over. So let's take that fact and return to my foot standard discussed earlier. When Rachel Oates chose to keep that information up, attempting to blame the victim who was in a private mental health support group, at that point, the initial incident being an accident became immaterial. Her actions, at that point, were no better than someone who had done so deliberately. And this is something I say as a person put in a very similar situation. In December 2019, less than two months after the events of September that we'll get to in a couple of videos, someone began posting Telltale Atheist's real name to my videos whilst also tagging me on Twitter, earning a public scolding and a block. However, when Chris from Chrisiosity came to me explaining how Telltale was concerned about all of this, I removed everything, including my scolding of the person in question, immediately. In spite of all of the shit Telltale Atheist had done to me, resorting to trans misogyny to paint me as this inherently violent monster, I still did the right thing without hesitation. Because my code of ethics is something I act on, not something I pretend to have. So yeah, I think I'm perhaps the best person to judge Rachel Oates on this, not merely being a trans person, but a trans person tested under a similar situation. I can say with certainty that I would have done the right thing, because I did. Unlike her. Furthermore, just think of how different things could have been had she done this? How, if nothing else, Oates could have shown Woodford how to fix things. But she wouldn't. Why? Well, I think it goes back to that ego of hers. The mere idea that she's not perfect, that she could do something as extreme as dox a victim of harassment to their harassers, is something she outright refuses to entertain. All because it hurts her constructed brand, her image. As for what this says about Oates' character, sadly, I'm not allowed to say, since she has decided to weaponize the UK's draconic defamation laws. All I can do is show you the evidence and lead you to ask yourself whether these actions could constitute transmisia, to keep the conversation alive long enough that, hopefully, more people take a look. So what do you think? How do you feel about cis people telling trans people what they can and cannot do to stay safe? How would you like cis allies to respond when their friends are transmisic? How do you feel about the idea that no other trans person took issue with the actions of the ACA? Did I show you anything that surprised you? Have you changed your mind about anything after watching this video? Did you notice something? 
I missed? If so, be sure to let me know down below. And if you appreciate what we do here and want to help out, please consider becoming one of our wonderful patrons who make our work possible. On that note, we'd just like to thank the following people. Matthew Kovac, Gerd van Vorst, Hannah Banghart, Marble Wings, Sosh Daniels, Flynn, Darnit Dante, and Higgins the Seagull. And for myself, Adita and Levi, take care now.